We love hearing from you. We just love your story. Your story matters because your life matters and from your world because your world matters. God loves you. God loves you and we love hearing your story. Did you know in John 14, Jesus said, I will not leave you alone without comfort or help. Then he went on to say that he would send the comforter from Father God, the precious Holy Spirit, to be our helper, our guide, to show us things to come. So let's just pray right now and appropriate all those benefits. Precious Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you that you have so abundantly supplied for us. Lord, you care about us, our life our world, where we live, our home. Father, thank you for that. Thank you that you want to live with us. We believe we receive all of your help. And we know that Jesus has the Holy Spirit on assignment to reveal, to show things to come and unfold this word of truth into our lives. We believe we receive it. Say that. I believe I receive it in Jesus' name. Ultimate Living Part four, the art of giving. I'm loving this series. This is amazing. This is for you. We are learning so much because God has ultimate living for you. Just a quick review now. Ultimate living is to the utmost. That's what we've been learning. It's the highest degree. It's just not one dimensional, but it's holistic. It's entire. God views your life as entire, integral, not a worthwhile piece here and there and a disposable piece over there. God views your life as entire, the whole piece. Part two, we learn that ultimate living is relative. It's customized to you because you're unique. You're an individual. That's how God made you and that's how God sees you. And then in part three, we heard God say, taste and see. Oh, that was so good. He's so good. God's so good and he's ready to bless you. We discovered a disorder many of us have that's a word aversion. A word aversion to truth, to goodness, love, blessing, and health. We got a word aversion to healing, forgiveness, mercy, provision, prosperity. There's that P word, prosperity. A spiritual disorder causing a life aversion. It's a serious thing. This session is the adventure where we uncover the art of giving. Part four, the art of giving. Well, Pastor Stephen, this isn't that materialism prosperity gospel, is it? No, but it's definitely not the poverty gospel either. You know that lie that says lack is somehow a virtue? Oh my goodness, that's dangerous. That's crazy. There are deep ditches of deception on either side of this road called ultimate living. You can be poor or rich and still be very materialistic. That's when stuff consumes your thinking. You can be poor or rich and be greedy, grasping, coveting, envying. That's a poverty mindset. Yes, there are people with great net worth that have a poverty mindset. They're fearful, they're stingy, they're miserable, they got no joy. Listen, if your self-worth is attached to your net worth, you've got a major problem, a major one. So let's address the elephant in the room, the, the give to get axiom. We need clarification, don't we? We need biblical clarification. Is it give to get or is it get to give? We all need reorientation to the truth, God's truth. Some struggle with word aversion and confusion over this topic because they've heard things. They've seen things, things said or done in the name of God or the Bible or blessing or healing that are offensive. They're hurtful, misleading, even manipulative, coercive. That's not God and it's anti-truth. Some try to distort the word of truth by saying things like, well, you know, money is the root of all evil. That's not what it says. That's a lie. 1 Timothy 6.10 says, the love of money is the root of all evil. Mark Twain, you know, the famous 19th century writer, novelist, humorist, he said, the lack of money is the root of all evil. <laughs> I'm sure a lot of people concur. 2 Timothy 3, verses 1 through 4. Now remember, this is Paul the apostle. He's writing to his protege, Timothy. And here's what he said. The last days will be dangerous times. People will be selfish and love money. They will be proud. They will slander others. 
They will be ungrateful and critical. They will be without self-control and won't love what is good. They are disloyal, reckless, and love pleasure instead of loving God. Now, somebody might say, oh, yes, see, I knew it. Pleasure is bad. Pleasure is bad. But that's not what it says. It didn't say that. The Bible says they'll love pleasure instead or in place of loving God. They substitute the blessing for the blesser. That's very dangerous, dangerous living. We're not to love what we get. We're to love the giver, the giver of all life, who is God, Jehovah. If your spouse makes a delicious meal, do you love the meal or your precious spouse, right? Matthew 6, verse 24, Jesus said this. He said, no one can serve two masters, for he will either hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot, he finished with this, you cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon is an infatuation, a lust for stuff. It's an idol. It's money. It's leisure, indulgence, technology, fame, applause, the love of it, the insatiable lust for it. Being fixated with getting your dopamine hit from social media is the spirit of mammon. Look how whole societies serve the golden cow of social media. They love it. They don't just like it. They love it. Mammon is all about greed, materialism, consuming, just consuming. But God is all about giving, loving. Are you getting an education so you can just get? Or are you getting an education so that you can give, so you can help? All of us either serve the get or serve the give. We're mastered by lust or motivated by love. Giving is the art of ultimate living, but a life that's just focused on getting is enslaved to mammon. Hearing Jesus say, give and it shall be given unto you, it could make people struggle with the thought that somehow Jesus is promoting an axiom of a, or a life principle summed up as give to get. You just give so you can get. Oh, you're so close. You're so close and yet so far. You see, it's not give to get. It's give to get to give. Yeah, it's all about the landing spot. Ben Carson, the famous neurosurgeon, author, politician, he said this, happiness doesn't result from what we get, but from what we give. It's give to get to give. It's the landing. It's all about the landing of the cycle. Give to get to give, not get so that you can hoard. When you get, you should fully realize that God is the source. Then crescendo again to giving helps us understand our purpose, our motive, our calling, our spiritual ventilation, if you will. If your cycle is stuck on get, you live stuck. There's no movement. Greed masters your mind. But if you let your purpose cycle, your life flows with movement in and out, then it becomes ultimate living. Give to get and then give to get again and then again, always landing on the give. As we've discovered, all of life is cyclical. You breathe in, you breathe out, you ventilate. Trees receive sunlight, water, and nutrients, and then they give away their fruit. That's their purpose. And the fruit also serves to tell us who they really are, who you really are. Fruit confirms your true identity. You don't need to drill to the center of an apple tree to find out what kind of tree it is. The fruit talks. The fruit identifies the tree. In Matthew 7, 20, Jesus said this, you will fully know them by their fruits. Look at that word fully. You'll fully know them. Whatever comes out of you identifies you. Is it generosity or is it greed? Is it thankfulness or unthankfulness? Is it praise or is it slander? There was a married couple in their mid-30s, and they asked me for some counsel. 
They were struggling. They were unhappy, unfulfilled. They had three children and they felt trapped. They were blaming each other for their lack of life, their lack of living. You know, I perceived that they were having a perception problem. They were unthankful. So I asked them a strange question. I said, if I could somehow come up with a million dollars, would you let me and Pam adopt one of your kids? You know, buy one of your kids for a million bucks and adopt them into our family. Maybe your least favorite. <laughs> but they both looked at each other trying to figure out where I was going and kind of squinted, no answer. I said, well, how about if I could come up somehow with maybe $10 million? I can't say I can, but what if I could? They started smiling, shook their heads. No, no. I said, well, what about if I could somehow come up with $100 million? Remember, we're talking about your least favorite kid. The husband shrugged his shoulders and he looked at his wife, finally opened up his mouth and he said, no way we would never part with any of our kids. We love them. I said, because you're richer and more blessed than you're giving God credit for, aren't you? You guys need to start counting your blessings, I said. And see what God has already done for you, what he's already given you. I said, you're ungrateful, that's your problem. You can fix this easy, the fix is easy. And they both thanked me and they walked out of the door hand in hand, rich and very thankful. There's an old hymn that says this, count your many blessings, name them one by one. My friend, that's good medicine. That's good life medicine. When you're only about the get, you become unthankful. Your eyes become darkened. You become stingy. You become tight and greedy. You become deaf and blind to the world around you. When you stop spiritually ventilating, breathing in and out, you go spiritually unconscious. You know, not too long ago, I had to get my blood drawn and uh, the girl said, hey, look at all these vials I'm taking. Well, I never look when they're drawing and I made the mistake of looking and suddenly my vision began to narrow, my hearing began to squash and next thing you know, I couldn't hear or see anything. I just passed out, totally embarrassing. Embarrassing. Some people have spiritually passed out. They're not seeing what's right in front of them. Give to get to give, or is it just get, get, grab the stuff, hoard the stuff. It's my stuff. We all need God's word, God's correction to reorientate us. We were born with this upside down thinking, this sinful, get me, give me, mine all mine, carnal mindset. But as a child of God, my friend, you were designed for generosity. That's what you were designed for. It's in your spiritual DNA. It's who God is. You were made in God's image and God is 100% giver. He's generous. Look at Proverbs 11, verse 25. The generous man or the generous woman is a source of blessing and shall be prosperous and enriched. And he who waters will himself be watered. She who waters will herself be watered, reaping the generosity that she has sown. Martin Luther King Jr. once said this, every man must decide whether he will walk in the light of creative altruism or in the darkness of destructive selfishness. I like that he said creative, as in to create, to produce. You see, we get the word generous from the Greek and Latin root, gene, meaning race, birth, and that which produces. It's the same root word used in the word generate, to produce. Can you see it in God's word? Generosity is a generator, a producer of blessings, and not just for the recipient, but even more for the giver. Paul quoted Jesus in Acts 20, verse 35, when Jesus said, it's more blessed or more powerful to give than to receive. Divine design predisposes you to a life of generosity where you generate blessings. That's your purpose. You make stuff happen, my friend, good stuff. You generate power with your generosity. Are you getting the gen there? 
You are a subsource, a fruit producing branch united with the ultimate source of all life, God. But a generation without the purpose of generosity, it hates and it loathes itself. It despises itself. Do you see it? You don't have to, I don't even have to predict the news tomorrow morning. You'll see it. It's right in the news every day. That generation hates itself. We have a generation that has been lied to and they think that life is all about the get, the give me. So they demand to be given to. Yes, they've been deceived. They're lost. Ultimate living is in the giving. My great uncle Vincent, great uncle. This was my grandmother's older, older, older brother. He volunteered to fight in World War II. Why? I remember as a little boy asking him, why would you do that? Why do people volunteer to risk their life, to lay down their life, to defend their country from tyranny? He said, and he just spoke it very plain and simple. He said he would be willing to give his life to defend his family, his country, and the freedoms that God had blessed us with. He was willing to give his life. And he came close to doing that. He took a bullet right through his lung, but he lived. He lived to tell the story. There's nothing like listening to a war story where this old fellow pulls up his shirt and you can see the bullet hole right through his chest. God's word aligns our belief system for the art of giving. If there's anything the enemy of your soul wants to twist, it's your giving. If the devil can stop or confuse or divert your giving, he can shut down the cyclical movement of your entire life for life. So let me give you six common myths and lies about giving. These are myths and lies about giving. Number one, your giving can substitute for wrong beliefs. That's a lie. Your giving represents your beliefs. Cain gave a sacrifice to God, but with a twisted belief, and it led to the very first murder on planet Earth. Number two, giving entitles you to control the other person. No, you can't force others to do what you want. God doesn't even do that. And if anybody could, he should. No, that's manipulation, coercion, bribery, even witchcraft, the Bible calls it. Here's another myth. Giving should only be done to meet a need. Well, see, that implies that you should only give to those who have less. That's not biblical. God doesn't need your giving but you need to be able to honor him with your giving because your giving represents your believing. Remember, Jesus asked the woman at the well in John 4 to give to him, to give to Jesus, the maker of all water, and he jump-started her spiritual breathing. And when he did that, Jesus transformed her whole life her, by using her giving. Number four, number four myth, lie. The law of giving only applies to good seeds. Absolutely not true. You can give criticism, and guess what? You'll receive multiplied criticism. You can give slander and ruin the value of your own name for decades. You can cheat people, and you will be cheated beyond your wildest imagination. Number five lie. Giving is always approved. Absolutely not. That's not true. Proverbs 21 verse 27 says, the sacrifice of the wicked is extremely disgusting and abhorrent to the Lord. Look, obedience is better than sacrifice. And let me give you one more myth lie. Number six, substitutionary giving is acceptable. No, let me explain this. This is totally false. When a child wants more than anything to be given understanding, acceptance, attention from a parent, and instead gets money, stuff, and unsanctioned freedom, that's called abuse, my friend. It's neglect. Giving money to someone when God told you to give wisdom to them, or mentoring, or even just a compliment, that's not acceptable, that's substitute. It's actually disobedience, or at the very least, ignorance. God's word teaches us obedience is better than sacrifice. There is a fine art to giving. I hope you're starting to see this. As a boy, I saw giving done wrong many times, where it used to, it was used to control people and manipulate people. If you've seen giving done wrong, it's easy to develop this offense toward the message of giving. 
So let me help you right now and give you five, five Bible truths about the art of giving. Here we go. Five Bible truths about the art of giving. Number one, giving is how we love and worship God. That's a truth. This is part of why giving is essential to ultimate living. We come before his presence, the psalmist said, with singing. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. That's what the psalmist wrote. Number two, giving to the poor is a loan to the Lord. This is a truth from the Bible. Proverbs 22 verse 9 says, He who has a generous eye will be blessed, for he gives of his bread to the poor. Proverbs 19, 17 says, When you give to the poor, you lend. Look at that word, lend to the Lord, and God will repay you. It's cyclical, but it's a repayment. It's not a multiplication. Number three on giving, giving is the act of sowing. This is a big one. It triggers the law of reciprocity. Galatians 6 verse 7 says, don't be deceived. Whatever a man, whatever a woman sows, that and that alone is what he or she will reap. That's a big one. Then number four, no gift can bypass unforgiveness or offense. Oh, this is a big Bible truth. Matthew 5, verses 23 and 24, Jesus said, If you bring your gift and remember that your brother has something against you, he said, first, first, here's the order, be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. This is the reason why a lot of people don't get a harvest on their good seed. They don't respect the biblical order. No giving can take the place of forgiving. And number five, let me end with this one. Tithing is an act of faith in God. You see, tithing is the act of returning the first tenth of your increase to God. You do not have to tithe. Let me say this again. You do not have to tithe. You get to tithe. Jesus approved it. Abraham did it. You know, many people in, in religious circles have erroneously said that tithing is under the law. They fail to realize that Abraham tithed as an act of worship in Genesis 14, more than 400 years before the law was ever instituted. In Malachi 3.10, God says, prove me and see if I won't open up the windows of heaven and pour you out blessings that you can't contain. Doesn't that sound great? Look, God owns everything, so tithing isn't God's cut, like some people suppose. He owns 100%. The tenth is simply a means of tangibly expressing your faith that God will do what he said he would do for you. It's proof positive that you believe in God. Look, even your country's tax office sees that you have faith in God. That's how it resounds. All giving, any giving, must be done by faith, not grudgingly, not reluctantly. If you don't want to give or you don't want to tithe, I would not try to coerce or compel you to because God loves a cheerful giver, not a giver who feels constrained, forced, pressured. I got to pay my dues. No, that's not God. If you don't get the revelation of this, then you can't give from the revelation of this. I used to tithe because I thought it was like paying my dues. It was, I was under obligation and I was constrained, but then I got the revelation that I get to do this. Suddenly, everything changed in my life, and I mean everything. You see, there's an art and accuracy to giving. You don't have to eat, do you? You get to eat. You don't have to breathe. You get to breathe. No spouse wants to be married to someone that has to be with them. Nobody wants that. Hebrews 11 verse 6 says, but without faith, it's impossible to please God, for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Some translations say the rewarder. Remember in Matthew 25, the master, the Lord rewarded the good stewards. Their reward was more opportunity, more responsibility, more influence, more joy, ultimate living. In John 3, 16, the Bible says, God so loved the world that he gave. Look, the evidence of faith is in the giving. The evidence of love is in the giving. God himself works the art of giving. He wanted a family. He gives us his son. 
God has a giving nature, a generous, a generating nature. That's how he made you. You're made in the image of his generous, generating identity. It was 1946, and a widow with three young daughters was trying to make ends meet. Her husband had died five years before, leaving her with seven kids and no money. The four older children had since grown up, moved out, leaving just the three young girls. Ossie was 12, Edna 14, and Darlene was 16. They were a church-going family, and one Sunday, the pastor of their congregation, he announced a special offering would be received for a poor family in need one month from today. Well, the girls came home excited, talking about it all, and how that they could raise money for this family. They decided to buy 50 pounds of potatoes to live off of for a month, and this would save them $20 on their grocery bill. They would try to keep their lights turned off and not use the radio and saving money on utilities. The girls got as many yard and house cleaning jobs as possible, plus babysitting jobs. They bought a bunch of yarn. They made pot holders for a dollar and sold 20 of them. The girls were so excited and found the month to be the best of their lives. At the end of every day, the family would sit in the dark talking excitedly about how this would bless this family the pastor knew just needed help. There were about 80 people in the church, so the girls figured whatever they raised, the congregation would probably raise 20 times that much. Well, Saturday before the big day came, the girls walked to the grocery store and they had the teller give them three, three crisp $20 bills, one ten for the change that they had collected. The girls had never seen so much money in their life. $70 in brand new bills. Well, Sunday came and even though it was pouring rain, they didn't care. They were so excited. They sat in church wearing their old wet dresses. And when it came time to receive the special offering, each girl put in a 20 and mom put in the 10. After church, they walked home singing the whole way. Their mom surprised them at home. She'd bought a dozen eggs so that they could have a special meal of boiled eggs and fried potatoes. Wow, what a feast. Later that afternoon, the minister came to the door, and after their mom spoke with him for a few moments, she returned to where the girls were with an envelope in her hand. She didn't speak, but she opened the envelope, and out fell three crisp $20 bills, one ten, and 17 one dollar bills. No one spoke a word. Instead, they all just stared at the floor. They went from feeling like millionaires to feeling like garbage, trash. They felt ashamed. The girl said later that they always felt blessed knowing their family loved them. Even with their dad having passed on, they still had a very loving mom. They were blessed. They knew it. They knew that they didn't have a lot of stuff, but never thought that they were poor. Suddenly, they realized we're poor. The minister, unintentionally, he made it official. He said that they were raising money for the poor family. So they must be poor. The girls didn't like being poor. Now they were conscious of their own worn out clothing. Everybody at church must think, well, they're the poor people. Maybe even the kids at school think that. They sat in silence for a long time before going to bed in the dark. The next week was a tough week. It was a sad week, a discouraging week. On Saturday, their mom asked the girls what they should do with the money, but the girls didn't know what to say. There was no joy, no joy in the getting. They didn't know. Sunday came again, and the girls didn't even want to go to church, but their mom insisted. At church, they had a missionary speaker. He talked about how the church buildings that they were constructing in Africa were made of sun-dried bricks, but they needed money to buy the roofs. $100 would put a roof on a building. The minister asked, can we please help these people? Well, mom and the girls immediately looked at each other with big smiles. So mom reached into her purse. She pulled out the envelope and handed it to the girls. They excitedly placed the whole $87 into the offering plate and suddenly joy filled their hearts. When the offering was counted that day, there was a little over $100. The missionary was thrilled. He'd not expected such a large offering from such a small church. The missionary actually said this. He said this, you must have some very rich people in this church. Suddenly it dawned on the girls that they had given in the $87 of that little over $100 total. 
They were a rich family after all. Isn't that what the missionary said? Deep down, deep down the girls knew they were blessed, a very blessed family. Oftentimes, what you have isn't fully activated until you're willing to give it away, to let go. Like a seed to the ground, it finally has the opportunity to regenerate. Let me ask you this. Has Jesus, the Son of God, died on the cross for you? You're rich then. Has Jesus suffered to redeem you from the curse of sin and death? My friend, you're blessed. Has God sent his son to lay down his life in exchange for your life? Well, then you are so loved. Has God given you breath? Has God given you even another heartbeat? Well, there's hope. Yes, there's hope. How should you respond to all this getting? By giving. Give God your heart. Give him your life. Give God your best. Yes, but also give God your worst. Lay it all down at the foot of Jesus' cross. Do you want self-worth? Quit focusing on your net worth and practice the art of giving. Let God establish you on the rock of true identity. Whatever God has given you, it's time to complete the cycle and give God your life. Just pray this simple prayer after me. Dear Lord Jesus, you're the way the truth, and the life. You died on the cross to save me. Forgive me of all my sins. Come into my heart. Be the Lord of my life. I give you all of me for all of you. Thank you for saving me, making me a child of God. In your name, Jesus, amen. Thank you for sharing this very important time with us. We pray and believe that God's Word is guiding your life and your future from this moment on. Thank you for your generous support. Together, we're getting God's good news to others. Sign up today for the free Today's Life Talk, an encouraging gift from Pastor Stephen. He sends directly to your email. At Living Room Church, you are loved, and we pray blessings on you. Remember Jesus is Lord and in Him we can live life strong.